Hello, everyone. It's fantastic to see all of you here uh, today, and it's uh, my chance to welcome you all to the first talk of the year in our Leading Voices in Higher Education lecture series. These have been so much fun for all of us, and I, I feel like we, this one of the real highlights of this whole strategic planning process has been the opportunity to bring people to campus who are living and breathing and thinking about all these changes in higher ed every day. And we couldn't have a speaker uh, any more like that than our speaker today. The Leading Voices, as you know, started in 2011, and in the last two years it has been bringing so many of us together. And I think uh, you'll notice that there are even a few more lectures coming up uh, in the spring term, so we hope you'll continue to join us. Jeff Salingo, today's speaker, has probably reached more people on campus and in the nation on these topics than any lecturer we've ever had. I first met Jeff, actually, when he came to campus as part of the inauguration of Jim Kim. We sat at a table together and even at that time had a fantastic conversation thinking about the, the future of higher ed. So I know this is something that is very important to you and, and been a part of what you've been thinking about for a number of years. As you all know, as editor at large of the Chronicle of Higher Education, top news source for more than 70,000 academics, Jeff has spent much of his journalism career covering colleges and universities across the world. Drawing on his many experiences as a reporter, as a columnist, as an editor at the Chronicle, he recently completed a book titled College Unbound, The Future of Higher Education and What It Means for Students. College Unbound is exploring the college of the future. He's talking about how families will pay for their education, what campuses will look like in the future, who the students will be, and how will those students learn and find their own place in the evolving marketplace of ideas and jobs. I think we all can agree that one of the big issues, college affordability, is out there, something we're all thinking about, new learning technology, the job prospects for our graduates, and their role as citizens in an increasingly complicated and diverse world are among very important issues that all of us in higher education are considering. I know how to turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk to our students, we realize that their needs and their own expectations about their education are shifting dramatically. And they've been shifting over the last decade, and we anticipate even greater shifts ahead as the demography and composition of the student population continues to change in our country and abroad. In a recent interview, Jeff said that colleges are being disrupted in every corner by technology, and that's disruption of a very strong and positive sense in my mind. It's things that cause us to rethink what we've done and think about doing them in new ways. And he says they're being disrupted by technology and by the students themselves who want their own education delivered in new and different ways, and in many cases want to participate themselves in the creation of knowledge and the generation of that education. He's been sharing his perspective with dozens of national higher education groups, several national radio and television programs, including NPR and CBS, where you've probably seen or heard him. His work has been recognized by the Education Writers Association, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Associated Press. He was also a finalist for the Livingston Award for Young Journalists, which is considered really one of the most competitive and prestigious reporting prizes in American journalism. Today, he's here to talk with us about a glimpse of a not too distant future in higher education, one that Di Dartmouth hopes and expects to be a leader. I'd like to thank, before I introduce Jeff, also the people that have been involved in setting these up. And in particular, I wanted to recognize the strategic planning team all sitting here uh, in the front row who have been working with all the groups and also helping us organize these amazing seminar series. And I also want to thank Jeff, who has already been here, meeting with faculty, talking with people, and sharing his ideas on a pretty busy and active day. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Salingo. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Carol, for that uh, kind introduction. 
Um, it's great to have standing room only, I guess, uh, here. Um, I have a confession to make, uh, if you noticed from the introduction Carol made, uh, is that uh, one thing you'll notice is missing from my bio is that I've never worked on a, on a college campus. Um, and so, uh, but I'm here as a journalist and I've come to realize over the 15 years of covering uh, higher education that, uh, that, that faculty and journalists are sometimes, I think, cut from the same cloth. Uh, journalists like to write about change, but we don't like to be changed. Uh, that's for sure. And I, I think sometimes faculty members like to uh, teach about change, but they don't necessarily like to go through change. Uh, so in some ways, I, I think we're, we're, we're very similar. Um, you know, my hope today is, is to paint a picture of, of the coming change, uh, uh, of the change coming to higher education. And my intention is not to be all doom and gloom, although some of you might think that at least halfway through the presentation, but to lay out pathways and what I think are opportunities uh, for institutions uh, uh, to, to allow higher education to live up to the promise I think it holds not only for this country but for the world as a whole. Uh, my observations are, are based on 15 years of covering higher education in a variety of roles uh, for the Chronicle of Higher Education starting both as a reporter and eventually being the top editor uh, from 2007 to 2011. As I was describing to some of you earlier today in the summer of, of 2011 I was invited to uh, Harvard Business School for a session that uh, Clay Christensen was putting on there. He was about to come out with his book on, uh, on, on reinventing colleges based on his theories of disruptive innovation. And as I explained to a few folks earlier today, some of what I heard that, that day kind of fascinated me. Um, and in other, in other ways, it frightened me uh, uh, because of the future he was laying out uh, for, the, for higher education was not the future, at least, that I was editing uh, as editor of the Chronicle. And so I went home uh, from that, from that day-long session, and I wrote this very long memo to my boss, and I said, I want to go out and investigate uh, what's happening uh, to the future of higher education. And that's what I've essentially spent uh, the last uh, a year and a half uh, doing. I stepped out of my day-to-day -day job uh, at the Chronicle as editor and took on this new role uh, as editor at large and spent the last year and a half visiting college campuses, talking to professors, uh, trustees, uh, presidents. I've spent time in high schools, middle schools, uh, talking to employers about where they think higher education is going. And that's a lot of what my comments today are going to be based on, those interviews. Not, not, uh, not necessarily research uh, that, that many scholars would undertake, a lot of it based on, on anecdote, uh, but and on, on the students I met. Uh, uh, and also more general, uh, I think that the future pathway for institutions differs, uh, whether you're Dartmouth or the University of Massachusetts or a small liberal arts college. Uh, there's not necessarily one pathway leading toward the future. And so what I lay out today, I think, is what I think is going to impact a lot of universities but Dartmouth's future, I think, is, is secure in some ways that other institutions are not necessarily um, as, uh, as secure in. So how many of you remember uh, the Jetsons, uh, the 1960s era cartoon? Well, you might remember it had, of course, a, a future uh, of flying cars and robot maids and, and, uh, and flying houses or, or houses kind of suspended in, in midair. And we know that this was the future that people back in the 1960s at least thought we would be living in today. And I, I point this out because this is what makes uh, foretelling the future, telling the future a little bit dangerous. Uh, so uh, so I, I must say up front uh, that uh, perhaps take a little bit of what I talk about today uh, with a grain of salt because at least the folks back in the 1960s thought that this is the world uh, we're going to be, be living in. Um, and to be honest with you, I think when I go to a lot of conferences now, on the future of higher ed. There are people who believe this is going to be the future of higher ed, where, where thousands of institutions will go out of business and be replaced by, by computers. That's not what I'm going to lay out uh, today. And in fact, uh, here's what you won't hear from me today. Uh, residential colleges uh, no longer have a place. Uh, I don't believe that, and you won't hear that from me today. Online education is the answer. I think a lot of people think it is. Uh, you won't hear that from me today, and that the liberal arts are dead. Uh, and you won't hear that from me uh, 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 either today. But you will hear a future that is going to be different than the one I think that we're living today. And, and a lot of this has changed in the last three years in particular. And you might wonder why now. I, I think a lot of what I'm hearing when I go out and talk to college officials is, you know, we've been living through 
uh, uh, times of change for, for a couple of decades in higher education. College costs have obviously been a concern of American families for a long time. Why now? What makes this point in history so different? And I think that a lot of it has to do with the economic downturn of, of 2008. And three forces came to converge uh, after that, uh, that economic downturn. And one is that you know, family wealth really declined, uh, because, mainly because of the bust in the, in the housing market. And so families can no longer use their house uh, as an ATM. Uh, combine that with the fact that states have been contracting uh, as a result, mainly because of the housing bust, uh, on funding everything uh, from day-to-day from -day services and particularly higher education. So 29 states now spend less on higher education than they ju did just three years ago. You might think, well, I'm at a private, that doesn't affect me, but, but most privates obviously benefit from, from state programs, especially at the financial aid level. You add to that the fact that in Washington, uh, we're seeing a sea of red ink as far as the eye can see, um, and there's a lot of conversation just happening in the next couple of months about the future of everything from federal research dollars uh, to, uh, to the future of the Pell Grant program, or at least the Pell Grant program as it exists today. So you add all three of those things together, family income, states being uh, really constrained in their spending, and the federal government spending, uh, and it really portends a future to me where families are ready and will be paying more out of pocket. And when that happens, what's, uh, what kind of different choices will they be making uh, about the future of where their sons and daughters and where they might be going uh, themselves in terms of, uh, of, of a future of higher education? You know, so college costs now, to me, is really much more of a front burner issue than it ever has been before. And it's really tied up into something we'll be talking a little bit about today, and that is the value of, of higher education. So it's not just about cost anymore. Uh, we, we have a shifting paradigm now about to, to value and what you're getting uh, out of higher education for what you're, you're paying uh, uh, for it. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that the median net worth of American families hasn't been as low as it is today since the early 1990s. So as a result, as you can see from this uh, graphic, uh, tuition is eating up a larger and larger share of, of family income. So back in 2001, only about 23%, less than a quarter of, of median earnings uh, went to the average tuition price. Today, uh, it's almost 40% uh, uh, is going toward that. And as a result, parents and students are asking more and more questions about what they're buying uh, for what they're spending. And trust me, this is really on my mind. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home. Uh, and so as I've been doing these presentations, I've been thinking about for that three-year-old, what is college going to cost for her uh, when, she's, uh, when she's 18? I've, I've been thinking about this as I've been putting money into their, into their 529 plans. And so did a little calculation on the various calculators that exist out there. And so these are the prices this is just for tuition. The top amount, $74,000 for four years at a public, $213,000 for four years uh, at a private. Just tuition. Doesn't include other fees, doesn't include, um, uh, doesn't include housing. And this is, of course, the average, taking the average tuition and, uh, and putting about a 4% uh, inflation rate on it uh, for the next uh, 15 years uh, or so. And so if uh, family incomes remain stagnant or don't grow uh, as fast as uh, tuition uh, is rising right now, those numbers might not necessarily seem as high as they do today in 15 years, but they will continue to take a larger and larger share of, uh, of family income. And, and that's why I think that, that there's a lot of discussion now about why we need to kind of change uh, the current track we're on in terms of the future of, of higher ed. Now, obviously, those numbers generate a lot of press, uh, and they generate a lot of attention. But I don't think those are the only reasons why uh, there are a number of forces at work right now in terms of uh, the financial aid model, or in terms of the higher education model, and why it's coming under a lot of, uh, a lot of changes. And, and I've come to the conclusion that there's about five financial, political, demographic, and, and technological forces bearing down right now uh, on higher education. And the first is the fact that many colleges and universities are simply going broke. Um, so $307 billion now held on, uh, 
on, uh, in terms of debt held by American colleges and universities. So we see in the press every day uh, stories about student debt. We see very few stories about the debt held uh, by institutions. And this debt has uh, basically doubled uh, since uh, 2001. You know, and I take a picture of the climbing wall because uh, a lot of the debt taken on by colleges and universities over the last decade has been for student amenities, not necessarily for the kind of the core uh, academic uh, experience. And you know, there's nothing wrong with taking on debt. We all take on debt in our own lives to pay for homes and, and other uh, amenities in our own lives. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we think, we, we take on that debt right now in, in higher ed because we think the model is going to remain the same. Uh, for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, the net tuition revenue at most colleges right now is either flat or declining. Six, seven, almost 70% of colleges have either flat or declining net tuition revenue. What does that mean? That means that most colleges continue to hike their prices, uh, their published prices, uh, to the American public uh, every year, but the amount of cash that they're actually bringing in from those dollars is either flat or declining. And that's real cash, by the way, that they have to pay off this debt uh, or to invest in new programs and new people because they're turning around so much of that new money coming in back into financial aid programs. Uh, that's just not sustainable at, at most institutions. So what we're seeing, especially at most privates right now, is either that they're discounting tuition way too much uh, or if they don't do that, they're not filling the seats in their class. Obviously not necessarily an issue that you're facing right here at Dartmouth, but this is what is facing most uh, private institutions right now um, in the U.S. And at public institutions, uh, their cash crunch is mostly, mostly caused by the fact that states are getting out of the business of higher education. So if you take the current trends right now, in funding of public higher education in the U.S., where 80%, by the way, of students go uh, to college. And the fact is that the average state budget for higher education will reach zero across the United States in 2059 if the current trends continue. The first state, basically, to get out of the business of higher ed will be Colorado uh, in about 2022 or 2023. Uh, and then a bunch of other states will follow uh, with the last state probably getting out of the business again if current trends continue at about 2075. Uh, but the trend lines uh, essentially for the last decade or so have been uh, uh, going downward even, uh, even when times get good. Uh, the money is not necessarily coming back um, uh, for, uh, for public higher ed. Uh, as a result, uh, public universities are competing more and more with private universities for finding the students that can pay across the world. And so we've seen, um, uh, we've seen uh, uh, universities, uh, especially publics now, go out of state uh, for more students who can pay full freight. Uh, we've seen more and more students, or more and more universities go across the world uh, in, in, in an effort to gain more international students who also pay full freight. So this graphic, which might be kind of tough to see for folks in the back, was an analysis done for a small private college in the Northeast. And what it did was it, this university or this college wanted to look at what are the potential number of students that we really have who can pay close to full price here and are academically qualified. And so it took the entire number of 18 year olds in 2009, which is about 4.3 million, and it put them through a filter. Um, and it took out the students who didn't graduate from high school, it looked at the students who actually intended to enroll in college, who actually expressed interest in going to a four-year college, who had SAT scores above 1250, who had family incomes above 200,000, who wanted to go to a private institution, so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, out of the 4.35 million students that this institution looked at, fewer than 1,000 actually made it through this filter at the end of the day. So 900 and about 78 students made it through that filter. These are the 978 students, by the way, that every private college and increasingly public college is going after. Um, and it's just a smaller and smaller number uh, every year. And, and, and so really what propelled the growth of many institutions uh, over the last decade is the fact that there were many more well-qualified, uh, academically well-qualified, well-off students who really drove the growth at a number of institutions 
over the last decade. And that pool just keeps getting smaller and smaller. And now, uh, increasingly, those institutions are competing against public institutions uh, for, those, uh, for those students. They're not only competing against each other in terms of traditional higher ed, but we're now starting to see the rise of alternatives uh, in, in higher education. And, and these alternatives, in my mind, are getting better by the day. Um, and so I was telling Carol earlier uh, today in her office is that as I've been looking back through the history of higher ed uh, through the last uh, century, I re I've come to realize that probably over the last decade or two that we don't have as much of a common definition of what we mean by higher education in this country. 1940s, it was about uh, uh, educating the returning GIs. The 50s, about the space race. The 60s and the 70s, uh, and even part of the 80s, about the, the Cold War. But since then, we seem to have much more uh, differing opinions when you ask folks about what they think of when they think of post-secondary education or higher education in this country. And increasingly, part of that reason is because we have a number of alternative providers cropping up in, 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 this, in this conversation. Khan Academy, uh, now reaching uh, you know, millions of users a month. Uh, many of the high school students that I've talked to who didn't really understand a concept in class would go home and would fire up the Khan Academy um, to learn something that they didn't learn uh, in the classroom. The Open Learning Initiative, which is now out of Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, which has now designed uh, two dozen courses uh, uh, basic uh, building block courses uh, and are sharing them with uh, universities around the globe uh, thanks to uh, 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 grants that it has received. Uh, Western Governors University, which was actually started in the late uh, 1990s, didn't really take hold uh, by the, the governors out west that, uh, that decided to start it, but now is growing at a 40% rate every year. Uh, uh, the average student there finishes college in two and a half years and pays $18,000. How? It's based on competency. Not based on how much time you spend in this seat, but based on what you learn. Uh, and so it assesses your learning as you walk in the door. Uh, it assesses your learning through the period that you're there. So if you know something, you move on. If you don't know it, you focus on it and you stay with it. If it takes you 10 weeks, great. If it takes you 15 weeks, uh, that's all right. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not based on uh, how much time you're spending in the seat. It's based on, on what you know. What's interesting about this model is that it's really gaining ground, in my opinion, and, and some of what I think is partly the true innovation happening now uh, in higher ed. Western Governors has since set up shop in Texas, in Indiana, in Washington State, um, and, is, and a number of other states are talking about bringing the model in to compete against the public universities in their state. Uh, but most important, more importantly, I think, is that um, more important, I think, is that uh, three universities right now uh, have received permission from the education department to offer competency-based degrees on their campuses. Northern Arizona, the University of Wisconsin System, and right down the, the road here, uh, Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, and so the education department has allowed them uh, to offer financial aid uh, for competency-based degrees uh, at those traditional universities. And so you're now, for the first time, uh, Western Governors was kind of always this odd oddball out there. Uh, you're now going to see these traditional uh, universities offering uh, these competency-based uh, degrees. And then finally, of course, what everybody has been talking about uh, over the last year are the MOOC providers. Uh, Coursera uh, and, and edX and uh, Udacity uh, and others. And, and, and as I was telling a group earlier today, uh, how this kind of movement grew over the last year is kind of fascinating to me. When you think about the fact that Coursera didn't even exist a year ago, and today it has 33 university partners, 200 plus courses, and 2.5 million uh, uh, students as part of it, uh, is, is really a testament to, I think, uh, uh, where higher education is beginning to move um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the future. And so in on top of this uh, crowded marketplace is one of the reasons uh, that I think colleges and universities are increasingly having a more difficult time proving uh, their value. So every year, a number of uh, surveys ask Americans what they think of the value of higher education. Again, not the, not the cost of higher education. For a long time, people have been complaining about the cost. But, but whether a college education is, is still a good investment. And as you can see, uh, this really tracks along the economy. The bad economy means 
uh, uh, some people think that their, uh, that their college education or the one that they're investing for their son or daughter is not necessarily a, a good idea. Now, we all know in this room, I think, that, that college is, is worth it. Um, despite all the stories I think you've been reading recently about don't go to college, uh, prompted largely by these Thiel uh, uh, fellowships where Peter Thiel offered uh, money to students to drop out of college or skip college and, and, find, uh, and start their own companies. Um, we all know that, uh, that, that, that people who have uh, bachelor's degrees and, uh, and advanced degrees uh, are, have higher earnings over the course of their lifetime, uh, are less likely to be unemployed, and on a number and a variety of other measures are happier, are more civically engaged, are healthier. Uh, so we all know, I think in this room, uh, that, that college is, is worth it. But, but no longer, in my opinion, can colleges ride the coattails of higher education uh, in, in general. Um, and so we know these national averages, but the fact of the matter is, is that the public is demanding uh, or asking more often now, what is the value of a degree from this particular institution? And so in the future, I think, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, how I think institutions need to more at their level at, whether it's a program level or more importantly at an institutional level, prove their value compared to other uh, institutions. And on this measure, I really think that, that the current crop of institutional leaders is a little tone deaf. And so uh, over the last year, a couple of entities have taken surveys of college presidents and of the American public on this measure. And they've asked, uh, and they've asked the American public and college presidents the same exact question. How would you rate uh, the, the value of, of higher education for the money spent. And in college presidents, 76% uh, uh, said it was an excellent or good value, and the public, about 57%, said it was a fair or good value. And this is what I refer to as the value gap, uh, that, the, that the people leading our colleges and universities uh, think that what they're providing is of excellent or good value, and in many cases they might be right, uh, but that the public uh, in general, uh, and you can see from the numbers behind this, this, this number has been declining, is that they're a little bit more skeptical of the value of this, um, uh, of this uh, proposition right now in, in higher education. And to me, really, to turn around uh, these trends, uh, a desperate need exists uh, for some big ideas to emerge that will reform uh, entire institutions and really transform what we think of as, as higher education uh, in the US. And instead, in many ways, I think we're getting a lot of sameness um, because institutions are really obsessed with moving to the next level in, in higher education. We all know uh, this is called Harvard uh, MV. Um, and uh, you know the prestige race in higher ed, uh, I think, dominates thinking in so many ways. And, and, and this is a quote from a book that I read recently where, where prestige in higher education is really like profit to corporations. Um, and as a result, there's really little incentive uh, for college leaders or colleges themselves to follow a different path than the institution uh, ahead of them uh, or to look radically different. Um, so as a result, uh, most innovation happens around the edges. If you want to be the institution five spots up from you in the US News rankings or name any other rankings, uh, the best thing to do is to copy what they've done uh, rather than to be different uh, than what they're doing. And so really this kind of this prestige obsession that we have in, in higher ed, the rankings obsession, uh, really to me limits innovation and really limits institutions from looking different than each other and why we have, in my mind, a lot of the sameness uh, in, in, in higher education. And as I've visited college campuses over the last year and a half, I've come to realize that uh, we have a lot of romantic, there's a romantic vision uh, of what we think of in, in terms of, of higher education. You know, the, there's the leafy quad, the neo-Gothic buildings, the, the fall football weekends. We really have this vision in the US of what higher education is. But in reality, this is what higher education, this is what's happening on, on colleges and, and universities. Four in five students report to researchers that they're drifting through college, that they don't kind of know what they're there for or why they're there. Uh, a, a third of students now transfer at least once before they graduate uh, to a different uh, institution. And increasingly, by the way, they're reverse transferring. 
they're transferring from four-year institutions uh, to two-year institutions. And every year, 400,000 students are dropping um, out of higher education. And so in some ways, it's become, at some places, not all, uh, it's become uh, kind of an expensive warehouse uh, for students who are not quite sure uh, what they want to, to do in, in, in life. And in some ways, I think, as I've walked around uh, campuses, uh, and I visited large publics, small privates, uh, regional publics, uh, and, and, and regional privates as well over the last year and a half, I've come to realize, again, not all and not every, uh, and not every course on every campus, but that the delivery method of instruction has largely remained the same uh, from, from generations when, when students mostly worked alone uh, and when professors lectured, like me, uh, in, in front of large classrooms uh, like this. And, and as I go around to college campuses, those lecture halls still exist, although they're in color uh, today, not black and white, uh, from as generations ago. But students uh, are accustomed to really toggling between devices as they work more collaboratively. Uh, and again, uh, understanding that uh, at many campuses and in many courses at, on those campuses, uh, the courses have been redesigned to respond to this change in the, in the generations. But for the most part, that experience on the left, I've seen on every campus. Uh, and, and for the most part, the students are working like those on, on the right. These are some of the students that I met uh, over the last year uh, as, I've traveled, uh, as I've traveled the country. And I've come to realize that while higher education leaders are looking for a silver bullet solution uh, to their current problems, um, there really is none because there is no one single type of learner. These students and the dozens of others that I've met are completely different in how they learn and what they want to get out of higher education. So while higher ed and while the trustees who lead these institutions and the uh, administrators and faculty members think, well, if we just could figure out that one thing to change this, um, the fact of the matter is I don't think there is one because these learners are all, all different. And really two themes to me emerged as I talked to them uh, that I think that colleges kind of need to get a handle on. And one of them was that many students are really poorly matched uh, with the institutions they end up attending. Because I think that uh, the institution knows so much more about them than they know about the institution. Uh, and I'm hopeful that as uh, uh, technology improves the matching process, perhaps, uh, between the student and the institution, that that will be more of a balanced approach between those two. And secondly, I met many students who were struggling with their studies or their finances or both. And I met others, as I mentioned earlier, who didn't quite know why they were in college except other than that their parents wanted them there. And what I've come to realize is that uh, we lack a real high quality educational substitute for those who are um, ill-suited to traditional colleges like this uh, at the age of 18. Um, and it seems like we really send some kids off to college because there really is nowhere else uh, to put them. And so what I hope in the future is that more models emerge, that more institutions are willing to be different to serve the variety of learners coming down the pipeline and the variety of students that really are coming uh, to college uh, today. And so, as I said earlier, there really is no one solution uh, to the future of, of higher ed. And in my opinion, there really is no one-size-fits-all system like we try to throw all students in uh, uh, today. And what is merging, in my mind, is a new ecosystem that unbundles the current system we have uh, today. So this ecosystem includes hybrid courses. It includes competency-based degrees. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that now a number of traditional universities are experimenting with. Uh, it includes this idea of blending education between the K through 12 level and lifelong learning. Uh, this idea of federations of universities. So we now, the, the thing that interests me the most about edX and Coursera is that institutions that compete on every other level, whether it's for uh, research dollars or for students or for faculty, are now cooperating to offer these MOOCs uh, uh, to the masses for free. Uh, and I think that that offers a potential model for the future. We've obviously had a lot of sharing in the back office operations of universities for, for decades. But perhaps on the academic side, we can see very similar federations of universities joining together 
uh, to offer uh, uh, courses or other things uh, in, in, in the near future. And then finally, of course, we have MOOCs. Uh, but to me, one of the concerns that I have about all the media attention uh, that has been uh, showered on, on MOOCs over the last year is that it's really crowding out conversations about potential other innovations on how we can deliver the model of, of higher education uh, in, in, in the future. But, but in some ways, the MOOC uh, really kind of started this conversation on, on college campuses uh, in, the last, uh, in the last two years. So many of you know the story of, of Sebastian Thrun who's on the, uh, on the left, and Peter Norvik on the right. So these were these uh, two um, uh, Stanford University professors who decided to put up their artificial intelligence class online uh, in the summer of, of 2011. And they really thought that maybe 1,000 people would, would sign up for the course. They had been teaching this course on Stanford's campus uh, for a couple of, uh, a couple of years. And, uh, and at the end of the first week, 10,000 students signed up for it. And by the way, they hadn't told the Stanford administration uh, they were doing this. And so at the end of that first week, as Sebastian Thrun will tell me now, they decided it might be time to go to the administration. And you can imagine the reaction. Uh, this is Stanford. They, uh, you know, they reject nine out of 10 students who apply there. And of course, they charge a hefty amount uh, for students who do go there. And, and so after a series of meetings and, and more meetings, because of course this is academe and they had to have a lot of meetings about this, uh, they decided that they could go ahead with this course as long as, uh, as, long as the two professors uh, made two things very clear uh, to, to the students who were taking the courses. One is that they would not get any Stanford credit uh, for doing this and that they would not get any credential that carried the Stanford name. And Stanford said, as long as you protect our brand, essentially, uh, you're allowed to go ahead and do this. Well, it didn't really stop people from signing up. Uh, a front page story in the New York Times in August of 2011 pushed enrollment up over 100,000. And by the time they started the course in October of 2011, 169,000 students, or 160,000 students from 190 countries had signed up. Uh, and that really kind of, I think, propelled uh, this, this MOOC movement, a couple of other professors, including Daphne Kohler and, uh, and Andrew Ng, who have co-founded uh, Coursera, also offered uh, massive courses that same fall, both attracting around 100,000 uh, uh, students. 22,000 students, so their dropout rate was pretty high, finished the course, uh, and they received this, which was a, uh, a certificate of accomplishment, or a statement of accomplishment. Uh, the Chronicle wrote about this, uh, and we called it a certificate. That's why I, I slipped on that. And, um, and within two hours, the public affairs office at Stanford called us to correct it and said it's a letter. It's not a, uh, it's not a certificate. Um, and I think that Stanford and the others who are part of these federations are still having these debates over, uh, over what these courses mean uh, and what they're giving out uh, uh, from these courses. So I met uh, a student who took this course and got one of these statements from uh, Sebastian Thrun and, and Peter Norvik. Um, and he had been thinking about going to graduate school. He already had his bachelor's degree. He was trying to get a job at Google. And he said, why not? I'll just take a class. By the way, these uh, two guys also work at Google. Um, I'll take a class uh, from these two guys. And maybe if I do well, it'll help me get a job at Google. And so what happened is that he actually ended up scoring near perfect in this course. And at the end of the course, uh, the two professors emailed him and 1,000 other students who did very well and said, send us your resumes and we'll pass them on to Silicon Valley companies. Uh, and that's what, this, uh, that's what this student did. Uh, and a month after the course ended, he had an interview with Google, and he's now working for Google in, uh, in Pennsylvania. So here's a guy who totally bypassed what we think of the traditional credentialing system in, in higher ed. He didn't pay a penny for this course, didn't get any uh, credit. All he did was get this letter. But he kind of accomplished what he wanted to accomplish at that, uh, at that point. Uh, Two other interesting points about this course. One is that um, as the professors who teach this and others uh, remind me, they would have to teach about 250 years to reach this many students that they were able to reach in, in, one, in one semester. Um, and secondly, uh, Peter Norvig and, and Sebastian Thrun taught that um, artificial intelligence course on campus that same fall of 2011. 300 students had signed up for it. By the end of the course, actually about midway through the course, only about 30 students were showing up. Uh, and, uh, and most of them were back in their dorm room or anywhere else uh, taking the free course online, even though they were paying 
Stanford tuition. But the other thing that the professors noticed is that the students at, on the midterm and on the final scored a whole letter grade higher on average than the students in the previous semesters when they only offered this course face-to-face. -face. So the outcomes uh, were also uh, uh, better. Uh, Peter, uh, Sebastian Thrun, of course, gave up tenure at uh, Stanford uh, to go on to uh, uh, start uh, Udacity, which is one of the MOOC providers. Um, and so really where I see the MOOCs, uh, uh, the future of the MOOCs is I don't see them replacing universities, uh, uh, but I see them as part of a, a content play uh, for colleges and universities where they could be part of the flipped classroom uh, at one level uh, or they could be part of hybrid courses at the other. And when you combine that with what the Open Learning Initiative is doing uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon, I think really offer uh, a kind of a, a piece of this higher education ecosystem that I mentioned earlier. So for example, San Jose State teaches a circuits course uh, every semester and students don't do very well in it. 40% of students who take that course have to repeat it um, at the end of the semester. And so last year, they decided to use materials from edX's circuits course uh, to flip the classroom there. And at the end of that uh, semester, only 10% of students had to retake the course. So they went from 40% retaking the course down to 10 uh, by kind of redesigning the course and using uh, the edX material, not to replace it, but as a supplement uh, to the course. So that's at one level is, is flipping the classroom. And then at the second level is really truly redesigning the course into a hybrid uh, course. So last year, six public universities took part in an experiment uh, run by the folks at uh, Ithaca SR, which uh, Bill Bowen was leading uh, this, this effort. Bill Bowen, the former president of, uh, of Princeton, uh, was leading this effort. Uh, and they studied uh, freshmen who were taking a statistics course at six public universities. And they put half of them into the traditional face-to-face uh, -face course, and they put the other half into a hybrid course, where uh, the students only met face-to-face one time a week, and the rest of the time they used the learning materials developed by the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon. At the end of the semester, so they, they were able to do assessments of the students at the beginning of the semester, at the middle of the semester, at the end of the semester. They also gave them satisfaction uh, surveys. Students at the end of the semester, for the most part, had the similar outcomes in both the face-to-face -face course and the hybrid course. Uh, they also had similar satisfaction levels. Students liked the face-to-face -face course a little bit better, but it wasn't a statistical significant uh, difference. But the big finding uh, that, that they had uh, was that students in the hybrid course finished in 25% less time uh, than the students in the face-to-face -face course because they were able to move basically at their own pace because the course didn't meet uh, uh, three times a week. Uh, it only met uh, once a week. And to me, this is really the potential that technology has to play uh, in the future of higher ed is this ability to allow a lot more flexibility uh, in, in, the semester, in, in, the, in the calendar and in the curriculum. So if we think about the idea of seven and a half week semesters instead of 15 week semesters, which I know you don't have here, but, uh, but this idea of shortening the semester uh, if students can move on uh, once they know the material. Uh, a lot of universities now, especially big publics that have big remedial needs, are personalizing uh, education. So take, for example, Arizona State, which is using uh, this uh, software, adaptive learning software, which allows students to move through the remedial class, uh, the remedial math class at their own pace. Um, I visited that class in the middle of uh, October. Half the class was already done uh, because these students were able to move at their own pace and actually get into a freshman level math course that they received credit for instead of sitting in a course uh, that some of them were ready uh, to move on uh, from. And then, of course, I also think that this provides flexibility. Uh, there's a lot of interest. Carol asked me earlier, uh, I, guess you could ask, I guess I could say this question you asked me about three-year degrees, uh, and this idea of, of allowing flexibility. Uh, so this idea that some students could finish early, but some students might be able to take on other, uh, other experiences, uh, whether that's study abroad, uh, or other types of uh, experimental uh, uh, learning. Um, and it's really, to me, it means a potential future where instead of the focus being on the degree as a, an accumulation of credits, 
uh, or a student's major, uh, the focus can really be much more on the experiences that a student is going through. Um, so I've spent a lot of time, as I said, on, on college campuses uh, over the last year and a half. And I've, I've asked students and then I've asked employers what they value most uh, in, their, in their education. And, uh, you know, many students didn't really talk about their major much. Uh, they didn't talk about specific classes. Uh, they talked a lot more about professors, individual professors who were true mentors. Uh, they talked about experiences uh, in study abroad. Uh, and they talked about experiences, uh, whether they were in internships or co-ops or other workplace uh, experiences. And then, as I matched that up with what employers said that they wanted in graduates, I've come to the conclusion that maybe too much of our focus is on uh, kind of the, the current way we have set up institutions in terms of majors. And that, and that in some ways, uh, the future uh, should be more about the experiences uh, that students are accumulating. Uh, and those ex experiences really are around faculty mentors, uh, undergraduate research, uh, which in talking to employers and looking at various employer, uh, employer uh, um, surveys uh, rank very high among the experiences that they like their undergraduates coming in the door with and a global experience. And if you add, these are the things that over and over again I heard from both current students and recent college graduates as things that they valued in their undergraduate, um, uh, in their undergraduate uh, years. And it's not necessarily about their major uh, or, the, uh, or the other experiences that they had, but the, the fact that they had courses where they can really get to know faculty members, that they were able to participate in research in a, in a real way, uh, and that they had a global experience. And then underlying all of this was the ability to be creative, to take risks, and learn how to fail. Uh, and again, when I've been talking to employers about what they value, uh, and we could talk a little bit more about this maybe in the Q&A uh, because there is somewhat of a disconnect sometimes between uh, the CEO of a company and who's actually doing the hiring. But what I heard a lot over and over again was this ability to, to teach students to be creative, to take risks, um, and to learn how to fail. And by the way, when you add up all those things, they really, to me, say, uh, hey, a liberal arts education is very valuable. Uh, because you, didn't, you notice that I didn't talk about specific majors, um, uh, whether they were, uh, especially if they were more vocational majors in any way. But this idea of really, uh, uh, of, of experiences kind of capturing uh, the, future of, um, uh, the future of higher education. And so when you add all this together, uh, the fact that you could have a more flexible experience, um, just think about what this can do to both the calendar, uh, to the academic calendar, uh, to credits, and to this idea of having a much more adaptive uh, curriculum. Uh, this, this idea of infusing our thinking about personalizing the experience in a way where all of this is unbundled and much more personalized uh, for students uh, in, in, the, in the future. And really where I see a lot of opportunity and where I'm going to end my, my discussion today is around the beginning of college and the end of college. So think about it today. We, we have you know, 12 years of, or 13 years of, of K through 12 education. We, students graduate high school in June, and three months later, we plop them on, a very structured high school experience, by the way, we plop them on a college campus and think they're, they're ready for kind of this unstructured experience. And then four years later, we throw them out in, into the workforce. Uh, and really where, I've see, where, I see, where I'm seeing a lot of innovation is around the edges uh, of these two experiences. So the transition from high school to college and then the transition from college uh, to work. And I threw up four examples that I've come in contact with uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Obviously, Teach for America, very well known. But on that end of the spectrum, you have Venture for America, uh, which has basically copied the Teach for America model. It places recent college graduates in startup companies in what they refer to as second-class cities uh, across the country. But think about it. The startup culture in Detroit or Las Vegas or Baltimore is, is really thirsty for talented, young college graduates who might not end up in those cities. So what Venture for America does is it, just like Teach for America, it places these recent college graduates in two-year experiences with startup companies in those cities. 
And the idea is really, again, just like Teach for America, is to give them kind of that day-to-day -day experience uh, that perhaps those students will go on to uh, start their own companies, perhaps they'll go on uh, to get a, uh, an MBA or decide that the business culture is not for them. But, but this idea of a transition point between um, college and, and the workforce. And at the other end, and where I think much more work needs to be done uh, from the students that I met, uh, are, is the transition from, from high school uh, to college. So there's two projects that I've come in contact with in the last couple of months that uh, I just briefly want to mention. One is the, millennials, the Millennial Trains Project. Uh, fascinating project. I wish I could participate in this. So this summer, uh, it has, uh, Amtrak has agreed to turn over three, three cross-country trains uh, where they're going to place 100 uh, millennial students. So these could be uh, students who are still in high school uh, or recent college graduates. It's going to put them on a 10-day journey across the country with uh, a, a, another two dozen mentors uh, and some journalists as well. And they're going to be making whistle stops uh, across the country. Uh, and there's the, the goal of this project, uh, which was started by a millennial student uh, at, at Georgetown who did this in India, uh, is, to, is twofold. One is to get students to understand there is, by the way, a vast country uh, in between the East Coast and the West Coast and to come to appreciate that. And secondly is the idea that in each of these stops, they're going to be stopping for the day, traveling by night, is that they'll meet nonprofit leaders, business leaders, political leaders, and other entrepreneurs in these towns and cities that they stop in and figure out how to scale some of the solutions uh, that are happening in these small communities that many people never hear of uh, and, and scale them into other communities uh, across, the, across the country uh, and, and, and look at what are the obstacles uh, to change uh, and what are the obstacles to scaling uh, uh, these ideas. And again, uh, they're going to take three different routes across the country this summer. Uh, and I still think, by the way, that they're taking uh, applications uh, for this. The other one is, uh, is Institute, uh, which was, again, started by uh, a bunch of 20-somethings. Uh, and, uh, and their idea is uh, to bring back uh, the apprenticeship model uh, in, uh, in post-high school uh, uh, U.S. Most, most companies have done away uh, with apprenticeships. And so the idea is to build a curriculum around providing apprenticeships uh, to students who are either in college, post-college, or in some cases, uh, post-high school. These are all very small programs, obviously, except for Teach for America. But they're examples of what I hope uh, the future of higher ed uh, uh, will, will be in terms of providing more pathways to and through college. It's not that students don't need to skip college, uh, as we're reading about now, but it's more that I think that they need alternative pathways to and, and, and through colleges. You know, so this is a, a vastly different way, I think, of, of thinking about uh, the future of higher ed than at least I was reading about uh, in the Chronicle a couple of years ago when I, was a, when I was an editor. But in my mind, the days of the professor, the classroom, and the textbook being the only conduit for knowledge uh, are really over. Um, and that will prompt a shift in, in higher ed, I think, in much the same way as we saw the shift in the music industry, the publishing industry, and newspapers over the last, uh, at last decade. Um, this quote applies to um, publishing uh, right now, um, but I think it also applies, potentially applies to higher ed in the future. We're, we're, we're really uh, the teacher and the learner, uh, in this case, replace the writer and the reader, uh, and that everyone who, gets, who stands between those two has both risk and opportunity, and obviously that is the institution. And notice that it's not just risk. I, I really do not believe that, unlike some people, that thousands of institutions are going to go out of business in the next 10 years. There really is a value to place, uh, and there's a value to the face-to-face -face, uh, experiences. But there are some risks for those uh, institutions, and that's where I kind of want to end today before we open it up to, uh, to questions. And, and so in terms of the risks that I see facing uh, traditional uh, uh, residential college campuses. One is the commodity courses. So this idea that, uh, and I think this is very true at bigger uh, public institutions, uh, many of which I visited over the last year, where I would sit in a lecture course, 300 students, you know, Economics 101, uh, where it was all lecture-based, all test-based, 
uh, and by the way, using textbooks that you know every other uh, economics 101 course is using uh, across the uh, across the uh, across the land. And and really, where I see uh, the MOOCs potentially uh, disrupting that model uh, is is on those uh, is on those commodity courses. So what does that mean? Of course, those institutions really need those big courses to subsidize other things they're doing at the institution. And really, um, one area that I would worry about is this idea that uh, there's a number of cross-subsidies happening at most institutions. And I haven't quite figured out, I'm not a financial guy, so I haven't quite figured out how to replace those cross-subsidies, but eventually those uh, commodity courses are going to start shrinking as students find alternatives uh, and, and the cross-subsidies will end uh, or at least uh, be, sh uh, be shrinking uh, at some point. Uh, uh, third uh, is the corner on credits that uh, colleges and, and universities now hold. Uh, uh, just this past, uh, in the past two weeks, the American Council on Education gave their stamp of approval to four MOOCs uh, offered by Coursera uh, to allow them to go through their credit credentialing service, which will now allow students to take those courses and potentially, potentially I say, which is important, get credit uh, from their uh, home institution. I think this is only the beginning of, of, of other institutions uh, and other providers uh, giving uh, uh, educational experiences that will, uh, will give uh, credits. And then finally is, is the credentialing. Uh, I don't think this is really at risk at the undergraduate level uh, and probably not at risk at most graduate programs, but especially I think where it's really at risk is at the professional level. Um, so a number of uh, colleges and universities have started professional, professional credentialing programs uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. And what I see uh, in what, for example, the student that I met who took that artificial intelligence MOOC is that he was essentially able to bypass uh, that system and, and get his goal uh, uh, without getting uh, that professional certificate uh, or that, or that uh, degree. Where are the opportunities? I think there are actually more opportunities than risks for, uh, for colleges and universities. One is certifying the experiences students are coming through the system with. So we know that uh, going to college is not just an accumulation of credits uh, or else we wouldn't have a need for a curriculum. We wouldn't have a need for specific types of degrees. And what, one thing that does worry me about this kind of unbundled future is that uh, as students potentially swirl through the system instead of going through a straight line is that they're going to have a collection of stuff that doesn't necessarily mean anything. And so they're going to need somebody to help guide them through that process and most important, at the end, certify that process. And, and one valuable aspect I see, especially of residential colleges, especially those colleges that might be struggling with their current model, is to, is to be that certifier uh, of that experience and perhaps provide that capstone experience uh, in the junior and senior year, really focus on those upper level uh, uh, courses and then certify what that student is coming to them with uh, from those other, uh, other experiences and, and saying this actually means something. This actually means a bachelor's degree and for the most part uh, colleges and universities have been unwilling to do that uh, until, this, uh, until now because they felt if it wasn't done here it's not valuable. Uh, and, and, and I think that perhaps Dartmouth can say that. Uh, there, there's, a, there's hundreds of colleges uh, that I don't think necessarily offer the high quality experiences, especially at those freshman and sophomore levels. Who can offer it? Who can say that? Uh, college networks. Uh, so I really am kind of fascinated by the cooperation that places like a lot of the institutions in the Ivy League who joined with edX or joined with Coursera uh, are having in those, in those federations. And, and we're seeing that uh, with liberal arts colleges in the South. Uh, the federation of, of, of 16 liberal arts colleges in the South have decided to do more course sharing. Uh, so all of them can offer Arabic, but one can, uh, and they're installing these smart classrooms that allow very high uh, level experiences for students who can't take those courses on their, home course, on their home campuses. So I see again a future where colleges that used to compete on every other level of academics are now going to cooperate uh, a lot more. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to redesign the first year of college. 
uh, to blend the experience uh, with high school, to offer more capstone experiences. Why should, I, I wrote about this a couple weeks ago uh, and got a pretty good response to it, why should we be offering the best experiences at a college or university just to juniors and seniors when we know that, that mentors in that first year really mean a lot to students uh, in terms of, uh, of retaining them and, and coming back. Um, and I know that a number of colleges have really spent time redesigning that first year, but not really rethinking it uh, in terms of blending that experience uh, with, uh, with the high school experience. And then finally, and I think the biggest potential, uh, that the biggest opportunity uh, uh, in, in the future for colleges is to kind of prove this value. And I know, and I, I met with a group of faculty earlier today, that so much of the focus now is on economic value because it's easy to measure. Uh, but so much of what you do here, and you know this, is valuable in so many other ways, it's hard to measure. And if we could figure out a way to measure that and show how you're different than uh, the dozens of other institutions that you compete against, I think those are the institutions that are really going to be leading in the future. And as I told many people today, if you don't do it, if institutions don't lead in this way, others will figure out how to do it. And it's mostly going to be based on the economic return of higher education. We're seeing that in so many ways right now. A number of states now uh, have websites that allow you to look at the first year salaries by program and by institution uh, for, the, for the institutions in their state. And I just think that uh, whether it's the federal government with the scorecard uh, that came out last week that Obama talked about and in the State of the Union, or whether it's these state efforts, you're going to see a much bigger push on, on this kind of return on investment and value of higher education. So if colleges and universities don't define their value, somebody else will uh, uh, for them. And um, so before I turn it over to, uh, to questions and answers, I, I think that uh, you know, we really have heard a lot about the talk of the demise of higher education system, of the higher education system before, and, and we all can kind of laugh at those now. As I've gone back through the archives, uh, we've, the Chronicle has run stories in every decade since its fo uh, founding in the 1960s uh, about, oh, a hundred and hundreds of colleges are going to close in the next couple of years. Um, and of course, we now have more colleges than we've ever had before. Um, so they kind of look silly now, almost as silly as uh, the predictions in the 1960s of, of what a future world would look like uh, with, the, uh, with the Jetsons. And so I think that those predictions in many ways uh, seem greatly exaggerated and, and really furnish current college leaders with an abundance of, of, of overconfidence. Uh, but one of the things I've discovered in the last year and a half is that uh, the truth about change is that we tend to overestimate its speed. We always think it's going to happen tomorrow uh, when it actually happens 20 years from now. But we underestimate its reach and its depth. Uh, and so some of the things I might talk about today might seem silly in 10 or 15 years because it actually, the change that we are about to undergo uh, will be even, ha even have a farther reach uh, than, it has, um, than it has today. And so I thank you for your time. Uh, sorry, I just lectured at you uh, for the last, uh, for the last uh, 45 minutes or so, but I appreciate your time, and uh, I think we have a few minutes or so for questions. So thank you. Do you want to field them? Yes. Yourself? Thank you for, uh, for this very insightful talk. You've raised a number of issues about um, the value of mentoring. Uh, in our parlance here in Hanover, I think we talk about undergraduate teaching while our focus there, and cross-subsidization and the, the, the new financial model for higher education. Could you just give us some of your thoughts about um, what the future looks like for the institution of tenure and for the evaluation of uh, teaching and faculty? <laughs> uh, tenure. I, I always avoid questions on tenure. Well, first of all, we know that the, you know, the, the percentage of tenure and tenure track faculty jobs is declining uh, and that replacing um, with more adjunct labor, um, which in some ways is ironic because when you talk to students, um, when, what they value most about the face-to-face -face experience is the idea of having mentors and, and, and they talk much more about specific faculty members than they even talk about courses. And so here, in terms of trying to s cut costs, uh, colleges and universities are cutting the one thing that actually differentiates them in this marketplace of competitors 
uh, and that is of the kind of the full-time, at least the full-time faculty member who can actually spend time, uh, you know, mentoring, uh, mentoring students. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that I've always found uh, uh, kind of ironic in terms of what uh, co some colleges and universities are doing uh, to try to, uh, to save money. But, but second, uh, second about the, you had asked about, I guess really about the tenure and promotion process and how we value that. And what's unfortunate is that as resources have been constrained, there's much more focus put on research because that's where the money is. Um, and I think that we need, and I just said this this week in a, in a column, that we need to figure out a way to reward not only teaching, which has been a debate obviously over decades in, in higher education, but we need to um, give time and then reward those who are willing to, uh, to experiment, to do research in, in, in teaching and learning in this new environment, and then to kind of reform their courses and remake their courses. Um, and right now, uh, I haven't seen a lot of examples. Uh, I think there's a lot of administrators who kind of, and others who kind of talk that talk, but that when you talk to, uh, just talk to a professor at a uh, regional public university last week who will not be promoted, um, even though he has done a lot of work in terms of, uh, of, of revamping his courses, uh, and, and, and all of his courses now are hybrid uh, courses, which has been uh, um, advocated by the leadership of the institution, uh, but uh, that has not necessarily led to um, uh, be valued uh, during, the, during the promotion process. And so I think that if we think this is important, uh, that we not only need to give people time, because this is not easy, uh, and, but we need to give them money to do it. Uh, you know, the average uh, course that is redesigned by uh, Carnegie Mellon for the Open Learning Initiative costs about a half a million dollars. Uh, to redesign. Now they are really the Cadillac of this, and I, I spent a couple days with them in Pittsburgh, and you know they have learning scientists, and they have uh, they have a, a gra grad students, they have uh, the professors who are uh, expert in the, that discipline, uh, and then they have data scientists who are constantly looking at every little piece of how students learn. Half a million dollars to redesign those courses, and by the way, they don't last very long. They have to kind of come back and, and redo them again. So this is not cheap or easy, and so I think that needs to be. Um, I think that needs to be also valued uh, by the institution uh, in the tenure and promotion process. Have you seen any uh, credible business model for any of these MOOCs, whether it's edX or Coursera? Any, any other? Well, if you talk to them, uh, they... Independent. Independent. Well, because if you talk to them, they don't think the business model is important right now. Right? They, they really come from a different viewpoint in that they really come from this Silicon Valley culture that if you build it, we'll worry about the money later, right? Because their idea is if you get a lot of people, we'll figure out how to monetize that. Um, I think really where you're seeing the business model is, is on three areas, which I'll be very quick. Um, one is this idea of, of being lead generators for employers. And I think, by the way, that works in a very select few uh, industries, really one industry right now, and that's technology. Uh, you know, very few employers would be willing to pay Coursera $25,000 to find an employee. Uh, but, but that does work in that one area. Uh, second uh, are certifications and credentials. So charging students $40 or $50 uh, to, to get their, their, their learning certified. So that means certifying that the person who took the course is actually the person who took the course. Uh, and, and they're looking at different technologies to do that and then giving them a certificate in return. And then finally is getting uh, institutions to pay them uh, to offer essentially those commodity courses on their campuses. Uh, and we're already seeing a couple of institutions uh, look at uh, replacing uh, their commodity courses uh, with, uh, with these MOOCs. And so those, those institutions would essentially pay them a licensing fee. So those are really the three. I don't see any of them generating, in, at, on my, in, my, in my opinion, even with the volume, millions of dollars at this point. So that's a great business model for Coursera, but it's a lousy business model for Stanford because Stanford's paying full-time faculty to develop courses for Coursera. Coursera's then going to sell them to, you know, regional school somewhere else, and, and they'll, you know, profit out of it. Where's the discussion in terms of the institutions that are currently funding faculty? to provide MOOCs for which they're getting very Well, I, I think they want to see some of this return, right? Uh, so I think, in fact, Daphne Kohler, of, of one of the co-founders of Coursera, will say the only reason they're, they're pushing the business models right now 
It's because their partner institutions want to see a return on this investment, right? So Michigan, the Michigans of the world don't want their professors teaching these free courses without getting something in return. Uh, so the reason why you've seen a lot of announcements, especially out of Coursera over the last couple of months is because the institutions who are part of that are saying, hey, we want something back. It's not necessarily Stanford that's saying that, although they really are, have most of the people out there. Uh, it's the other institutions that have joined in, in the recent months. Daphne Kohler's coming here. Is it uh, April 1st? April 1st. Oh, great. Did yeah. I let, let you know? Yeah. But I think also a lot of the schools get a lot of publicity that they're not having to pay for. They, they spend a huge lot of money on publicity that they think they're getting out of the MOOCs, too. So that's, mm -hmm. you do hear them talk about that. You do. I mean, I'm just not, I, I'm not quite sure what they get in return. And eventually, you know, they now have, I think, 33 at last count. They might even have more now. They have 33 university partners. Eventually, you, we, you kind of lose track of this. You know, for example, the Chronicle, we used to cover like every single announcement from them. We don't do that as often. So eventually, that's, that curve of, of, of felicity is going to go downhill. Any students yeah. here that have a question? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was interested in your <laughs> remarks of the liberal arts college, <laughs> being a retired professor in that field, is declining year by year. You say don't worry about it. I am worried about it because we've retained the name, but we've changed the concepts. And we've seen the deterioration in, in how we think of these courses and what our expectations are. More and more departments become not departments of English, but departments of communication sciences and all that crap. Now, I know how you feel. Serious, <laughs> there's, there's a kind of evaluation in this process. And this evaluation is in response to some of the dynamics that, of course, that you have not you know, looked at you know, in short hours or short time. I'd like to ask you if, if you have given any thought to or examined the extent to which the trend towards universitization, well, ugly word, um, has affected the quality, in the Latin sense of that word, the quality of liberal arts and liberal arts courses. Because what I see is that the model of the university, the reward model uh, of the university, has changed the conduct of these courses and the purview that I, I can't really speak to quality. I could maybe talk a little bit about some of your points. Well, first of all, the, this kind of flight away from the liberal arts toward more vocational majors has been happening for at least since the 1960s. Um, I, I think it's been hastened. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I don't know how long you've been teaching, but it, it's, been, it's been hastened since then. Uh, and I think partly uh, by what I would call the second and third tier universities and colleges that in, in in order to, they think, in order to survive, they had to move more toward uh, vocational majors. So there's been a 20% increase in the number of academic programs and the number of majors on college campuses just since 2000. Uh, and and as, from what I can tell, most of them are driven by marketing departments uh, who think, hey, if we create a major in X, uh, we're able to differentiate ourselves from all of our competitors and, and that's what we think employers want. Uh, and as a result, we are suddenly going to be inundated with students, which will help our, our bottom line. Uh, but when you talk to employers, uh, again, and there's a lot of contradictions when you talk to employers and look at the surveys. When you talk to kind of the people who will be promoting people over the course of their lifetime, they, want actually, they actually like the traditions of the classic liberal arts major. Uh, you know, writing and communications and critical thinking. It's the people who are doing the hiring on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a great book that Peter Capelli at Wharton just wrote about why good people don't get good job or good jobs, something like that. And he basically talks about these. You know, everything's been automated now in hiring. It looks for keywords. Those keywords, including degrees in you know sustainability uh, or sports management or media entrepreneurship or you name it, any of these new degree programs. Cybersecurity, very popular now. Uh, and, um, and, and I think those, so I don't think it's necessarily uh, the move towards the, as you, what did you call it, univer, the university, becoming moving, university. becoming a university. Well, I think, right. I mean, I think it's been more about this idea of more struggling colleges and universities or others who just wanted to boost their enrollment in certain areas, really thinking about, hey, if we just create these new programs uh, and they're more vocational in ways, 
It's easier to communicate that to parents and students. It's easier to show outcomes. Hey, there's all these jobs being created after 9-11 in cybersecurity. Let's offer a degree in cybersecurity. Um, that's really where I see that, that happening. Jeff, I, think we have time for one more question okay. because there's a set of refreshments out there to encourage more conversation. And I'll be sticking around. And so. sticking around. So one more question for now and then. Could we get a student? Perfect. Yes. Two students. Two students. OK, two students, and then we can wrap up. And I'll be short. Yeah, speaking for a student's perspective, uh, I'm a, currently a junior at, at, at Dartmouth College. And uh, one thing that, that's been on my mind recently a lot is just uh, the way we, uh, uh, the, the, the approach uh, we have for study uh, from a student's perspective. This, um, uh, I, as a junior, I feel like a, a lot of my peers nowadays are like thinking about you know jobs, careers, that kind of stuff. A lot, a lot of things you just mentioned, like those practical skills. But then um, in our classes, um, I always feel like this mo model that we're using right now is kind of trying to mold us into professors. But then with the understanding that a large part of the student population aren't going to become professors in the future, but the only way to grade our performance or like our thinking or our experience, our college experience, is based on writing papers or like finishing midterms and exams. Mm -hmm. I, I see there's a huge disconnect there mm -hmm. because uh, like we're writing papers, a lot of the things, uh, it's, it, it's very good in the sense that it's a very good mind exercise. But then the whole college experience, as you mentioned, is more about uh, me mentoring and the interaction, not necessarily about getting knowledge. Right. Uh, 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 plus, I'm an international student from China. Uh, the whole idea of coming to the United States was to like, kind of run away from the like, rigid Chinese educational system. Right. But then the experience I'm getting here still is pretty similar uh, uh, in the in a sense that it's really based on midterms, especially we have a term system, where you have two midterms and one final in a 10-week span. And a lot of emphasis is being put into like the midterms, and uh, it's pretty much one hour midterm, but then we, uh, I think that the- What the, uh, So anyway, the question yeah, is- the question is really not. <laughs> so the, the problem is that uh, a lot of things, as a student, a lot of things, uh, I think people actually value from the divorce experience and what's actually going to matter in the long run are not actually being evaluated uh, in the classes. It's more about, uh, about tests and uh, papers, but then that doesn't really reflect the true value of liberal arts education. And then students nowadays are more concerned with going into finance, uh, consulting, which don't really require any of those actual thinking, uh, m much of the actual thinking at all. Well, and part of the problem is, just, I'm going to be very quick, I think two of the issues are, one is that it's hard to measure those quote unquote softer skills. Um, it's a lot easier to measure uh, the other things that you're, you're learning, and that's why I still think it's hard for institutions to move away from that. And secondly, I think that's one of the reasons why we need more of a blending of the experience into the, into the workforce, uh, is because there's kind of this disconnect between when students graduate uh, and, when, uh, and when they enter the workforce. And that's why you know, there's this term that was, I, 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 I took from a CEO I heard recently, who said that most, many students are struggling to launch. Uh, as a result, they're struggling to launch their careers because there is that disconnect between what they're learning in school and the workforce. So one last question. Yes, way up in the corner. I was wondering what you think that this means for Dartmouth, specifically. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a tough question. Do we have another hour? Um, well, okay, so in some ways, I try to present the 50,000 foot level. Uh, some of the stuff I think really impacts you. Some doesn't. I mean, I think part of the, the issue is that, um, uh, you know, you, it's so many institutions that I speak at are having trouble just literally attracting enough students to fill seats and fill beds. Their business model is really in trouble and they have to really rethink that. Um, you don't have that issue. Uh, you know, really, it's, it, your issue is, uh, you know, how to continue to maintain quality and increase quality and affordability. Uh, for those students who are, are highly qualified. So the issue to me becomes, what are the types of experiences that you're giving to students to kind of blend what is, what is your traditional undergraduate uh, uh, liberal arts experience that you're well known for and the workforce uh, experience? So really where I see a lot more opportunity uh, is between this blending, whether it's in college or right after college, between uh, trying to prove to the world that what you do here really does matter uh, by putting those students, I'm not being very articulate about this, but, but, put, but by having those experiences that allow, uh, whether they're co-ops, 
uh, or whether other work experiences within college or whether uh, or offering opportunities right after college uh, so that students are just not at sea um, when they graduate and, and decide, well, maybe I should go to graduate school to get, yep, to go more into debt uh, uh, or because I don't know what else to do, but to provide truly structured experiences right after, uh, right after college. And there's a number of small liberal arts colleges thinking about this, much smaller than Dartmouth, where they're thinking about uh, having kind of a post-graduate experience that bridges what they now see as the divide between their recent college graduates and graduates who are two years out. Um, and you know, talk to, one of the things that is interesting to me, the president who told me they're doing this, talk to graduates two years out and talk to their graduates who are hiring uh, people. And they, they said that we wouldn't hire somebody right out of this college, but two years out, we will. Uh, Davidson, by the way, I think I can say because I said this to some people earlier. You know, we wouldn't hire a recent Davidson grad, but two years out, great. But we need something to bridge those two things together. And I think that more colleges that are able to offer those experiences, and I think that's exactly what Teach for America does, that's exactly what Venture for America does, but can you offer that at the institutional level is the key. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.